cool. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, I think uh, this episode we're going to kind of focus on Luke went to um, Sam Houston National Forest in East Texas. So our national forest, is it national forest or national park? So it's actually a WMA. Um, the oh, whole thing is under national right. forest property, though, so it is federally controlled, but um, super cool area. Okay. So Luke went out there uh, for a solo hunt. Um, so we're going to kind of touch base on that and, uh, hear about, you know, my, my thing, how I kind of want this to go, Luke is, we not, I mean, I know you scouted cause I talked to you about the scouting, but I want you to break down three locations of why you picked those top three. Cause I know when we hunt together, we kind of, if we have, so say, you know, we're going somewhere at a WMA, we, we focus on an area and we break it up into quadrants. And then we plot out, you know, funnels, saddles, you know, terrain features, what we think is makes this area best. And then we'll break it down by, okay, based on this quadrant, we have this many signs, this one, this many signs, and then we'll pick out areas. And based on process of elimination from best to worst, then we'll pick our spots. So I know that's what Luke did with that. So I want to know, Luke, your after e scouting. Well, while you're e-scouting, what you look for, three locations, your primary ones. And when you once you narrowed those down, specifically those three spots, why you picked them. So, you know, what you were looking for that made you pick that spot. And then I also want to know what your setup looked like when you got into those spots. So we'll do location A, B, C. Gotcha. So, yeah, um, Sam Houston National Forest, it's it's basically 120,000 square acres of property. So it is a massive property in East Texas. Um, you know, I, I moved out to, I moved out to Texas, what, two and a half years, two years ago. And, you know, the idea was you go to Texas, you're going to be whitetail hunting. Everybody was excited. I was excited about it. Then you get out here and you realize, holy cow, there's like zero public land opportunities in Texas with the exception of going like dove hunting. So the, the DNR for Texas, they, they do have a lot of public land, but they, they limit those opportunities to draw. And so um, earlier this, uh, this year, what, what month was the draw Tyson? It was uh, like May, June timeframe is when the draw happened. So um, you can put in for these limited opportunities for draws. And, and I think me and Tyson, we put in for close to 25 different draws. I've put in land every year since 2017 in at least eight different permits and different locations. And I've never been drawn once. Yep. Um, so we, un unfortunately we were not successful in the draws, but you know, that's, that's all right. There, there's a, there's still WMAs. And uh, I moved here from Georgia in the, uh, the public land opportunities in Georgia. It's like a, it's like a free for all, man. They have, they do have gun hunts uh, specifically in Georgia that you can hunt on, but uh, it's different out here. Out here is uh, you go, it's you know, three or four days, they set you up in a blind, uh, most likely overlooking a feeder, and uh, you're going to be hunting whitetail. So Sam Houston National Forest kind of struck my eye when I first came out here, you know, listening to podcasts and such. Um, it was kind of the, the closest open land opportunity that was nearest to San Antonio. Cause I do live in Bernie, me and Tyson do, or I live in Bernie and Tyson lives in uh, Bulverde, which is just North of San Antonio. And so it's about a three and a half, four hour drive from us. So it, it is the closest spot. And uh, it's like I said, it's 116,000 acres, huge property. And it's not all the same size property. It's broken down into multiple subunits. I mean, there's, there's 45 acre plots, there's hundred acre plots, and then there's 20,000 acre plots. It's kind of broken out. So this, this property is like about 45 minutes to an hour north of Houston, which is a pretty big metropolitan area. Um, so I guess to answer your first question, Tyson, is when I first started e-scouting, I didn't want to be on the Highway 45 that goes straight from Houston straight to the National Forest. I didn't want to be one of the properties like off the left and right hand sides of that highway because I knew you have a huge metropolitan area, you know, what is it? 5 million people, maybe even more that live in Houston. Um, I didn't want to be close to that. I wanted to be off the kind of off in the cut. So when I started picking property, it was the areas that a 
were away from access. So um, they, it took a while to get in there, right? So I wanted to be able to walk like at least a mile and a half back into these properties from the gate. And then I was looking for terrain funnels and I was looking for transition lines from the hardwoods to the pine, piney woods. So just like in, in Georgia, they, they have pine plantations that are all over the place. And, uh, and, th and that is a good spot to hunt, uh, depending on how, what the age maturity of the pines are. So there's different classes, right? You'll have three, four year old pines, you'll have 10 year pines, and then you'll have about 20 year pines. And uh, the understory on a 20 year pine is pretty much all dead. There's no Forbes, there's no Greenbrier, there's nothing below those older age class pines. So you wanna see basically about a five, a three, four, five year old pine plantation that mixes back to an SMZ bottom near hardwoods. And so deer, specifically bucks, are going to be transitioning that, that line from the hardwoods to the pines. So I moved away from Houston. I, I was picking areas away from the Houston traffic. I was picking areas about a mile and a half back into this property. And then I was also picking areas that were um, transition zones that were going down to the SMZ hardwood bottoms from the pines. That's, that's what I was looking for. What was the we, we did have a we did have one question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Tyson. Public man, uh, public land mountain hunter asked us what app was I using to do my scouting. So I use two primary apps. I use HuntStand and I use Spartan Forge for the lidar. So HuntStand, I don't pay for the upgraded subscription on it. It's just the the pro account, but I use Spartan Forge because I have an upgraded subscription to that, which gives me access to lidar. Which lidar is a new imaging software. It's everywhere. But it kind of gives you kind of like what the creek bottoms look like and the train funnels. So that's what I was using, buddy. Um, so I know there's it sounds like there's you know a wide spectrum of um environmental options to hunt. So let's go into kind of where you set up. So your 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 three three spots that you broke down, what do they look like? Yeah, um man, I this is kind of a mistake I made is uh, I would say that if I were to do it all over again, I would have focused on uh, the same area over and over again. But the first one I, I walked into was a river bottom where there was a predominant creek traveling through the area. And that that predominant creek was about three quarters of a mile back from the, the front gate. So I was I was walking in blind, pitch black. I was using my red lamp going back into this area that I've never been at. And there's struggles that come along with that, too, like. You don't know what tree you're going to set up in. You don't know what tree is good for, you know, making sure you have an under canopy. Um, there, there's a whole lot that goes into that that, you know, could have been done better. But unfortunately, being away from the area, I didn't have time to put boots on the ground. So the first morning I went in there, it was I, I, I walked back three quarters of a mile to a mile back into a, a creek bottom um, that had had the oaks. And I was looking for water oaks because the uh, the the white oaks and the red acorns were had all dropped by this point. And the only thing that was dropping that was currently fresh was water oaks. So pin oaks, water oaks, that's what I was going for. And I was looking for the transition edge that, that held those. And I, I found it actually. Did you set up on that? Yep, yep, I set up right on the edge. Um, I'm using the saddle. So the only, the only issue was, is I was packing about 45 pounds of gear back in there, three quarters of a mile to a mile back into the woods. So that was, that was pretty tough. <laughs> so when you got up, you picked your tree and I'm guessing you picked a tree that had a pretty decent under canopy, but what did your setup look like? Um, so I had the wind in my face from the, the bottom. Um, so I was looking over a, um, Back when you when you really get into this thick timber that that is pretty overgrown and mature, um, there's there's a bunch of open canopy which creates open lanes for shooting. And specifically, I was looking for I was both I was I was shooting my gun. So at that time, I was looking for areas that had an open canopy that I could see sixty plus yards to seventy yards, and I wanted to be at that transition line. Um, that was dropping water acorns. So I was facing, the wind was popping in my face from the river bottom. And I, I was set up, I was 15, 20 feet up in my, my, my uh, not my climber, my uh, my saddle. So it was a three stick saddle system. The tethered one platform um, gets you up about 15 to 20 feet high, depending on how the, the distance you place in between the sticks. 
And then I used a predator platform. So my predator platform was uh, facing away from the, the area I was looking at. So I was looking basically into the tree down into the bottom where the wind was coming into my face. Did you see anything on that sit? How long did you sit? Did you get down move? So I got in there at 5.30 in the morning, um, walked back in, got set up before daylight. Um, so I was in my tree, set up in my saddle about 30 minutes before first light actually appeared. And then I sat there about 12.30 in the afternoon. And uh, I think I was talking to JW on the way in there. Um, it was a full moon at the time. So I knew... When, when I walked back, first of all, I walked back in that far. I was like, I'm not going to pick up and move at 9, 30 o'clock, 10, 10 o'clock in the morning after I put all this work in. I wanted to sit till at least 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so that's that first night, that first set morning, I sat there till about 1.30 in the morning. And um, I had a doe come in and then I had a buck grunt on me. The doe came in from that river bottom that I was expecting to come. But uh, unfortunately, she did cross my my entry path to where I had eventually set up, and she blew out. And then I think it was about an hour and a half later. Um, so one of one of two things happened: either either she blew on hitting my my entry, walking into the stand, or she was being finicky because it was in the, during the rut in uh, in East Texas. Because no shit, I had a buck come in an hour later grunting down the same line so she she may have been still in estrus and then still blew at me and then a buck came in behind her or it was she was in she was just finicky and kind of jumping all over the place couldn't really tell was she acting was she acting goofy or was she yeah just... no the whole the whole time is i actually have film on this too um her mannerisms and the way she was kind of I hate the word use the word frolicking, but the way she was kind of like maneuvering through the woods, it wasn't like a doe going from bed to food or from food back to bed. It was definitely had a different mentality. She was, she was definitely, she was probably interestious. I, you know, back looking back at it, that's, I, I can pretty much gather that. Um, so what was, I know you were out there for a few days. Ooh. So you set up that spot the first day. Did you move your second day? Yep. And if so, what, what made you decide to do that? Cause it sounds like you had activity there. So what, yeah. what went through your head to move you from a location where you had activity to go to a new spot? So I, I actually wrote this as one of my biggest lessons learned. You go into a public land area that you've never been to. I went there last year for like two days, but it wasn't the same as this one. Um, what I, what I should have done is I should have went back to that same area and set up for a different wind. Um, but my, the way my mind works is I, I decided to venture out to kind of see different pieces of the property. I wanted to kind of get my eyes across a larger, um, different, different types of habitat. I wanted to see different types of land features. Um, you know, in reality, looking back at it, I probably should have spent my time in this, you know, hundred to 200 acre kind of core property that I picked out on the maps to begin with. But I ended up not doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I ventured north probably 25 minutes to, you know, the north side of Sam Houston National Forest. And um, I, I set up on a on an open pasture that was kind of CRP field overgrown um, just to try to see. Because I was, I was more focused on, you know, seeing if I can get a, a full hunt on video. Um, when in reality, I probably should have went back to that spot. So it, it's, it's tough, man. Yeah. And then your, was it your last day that you had those guys walk in on you? Let's, yeah. uh, let's hear that. Yeah, that was the, that was the power line and that, that piece of that property, um, set up kind of good. Actually, it was, it was one of those overlooking spots, which I do tend to want to kind of get into. I want to, I look for those overlooked spots. So if anyone on, on a live here or anyone on the podcast is listening, understands this is, uh, you know, you have a piece of public land. Typically, you're going to be right at the gate. Trucks are going to park. People are going to walk back in, you know, three quarters of a mile to a mile like I did the first day. And then they're not paying attention to 200 yards down the deer trail off to the right. There's there's great habitat for the deer. And uh, they know they're not getting pressured from there. 
Um, this, this last day I was set up on a power line that was kind of an overlooked property. Um, I didn't, I didn't see anything that day, but it just, it just, I saw a lot of sign when I was walking to and from the sand and, uh, you know, it, it, that's why I chose that area because it was overlooked and, um, I shouldn't have been hunting in the power line, um, uh, to looking back at it. I should have been about 30, 40 yards back into the timber and kind of seeing deer go up and down that power line. Um, because the deer during the middle of the day are not going to walk out in the open, right? They're going to be hugging right along that, that, that hard edge, which a hard edge is like, if you, if difference between a hard edge and a soft edge is like the first day I hunted was that river bottom where it was a transition to, zone from hardwoods to pines. That would be an example of like a soft edge where the last day I was hunting where those, those guys came in on me, it was a hard edge. You had basically power line fields backed up to pines. So there was no trees in the middle of this field. What I should have done is I should have backed in, you know, 40, 50, 60 yards back into that timber because deer are going to go along that transition line. So um, I didn't end up seeing anything that day. That your that was your whole hunt, right? You're only out there for a few days. Yeah, I I think the other things to consider too is um you, you get in and you you start talking to local hunters, and uh there there is a certain way about people that you know that it's their local area. Sometimes people are gonna throw you off and sometimes they're gonna feed you a bone. Um the other day, I think uh I think it was the second day, I kind of got thrown off a little bit because nobody wanted me to be in their, their primary area. So they're like, Oh yeah, go find this uh, Baptist church and go behind the Baptist church about, you know, 300, 400 yards. And there's deer there all the time. Well, <laughs> I spent the entire second day there and basically it was a fresh clear cut where they're thinning out the timber. Uh, so it was, it was thin pines and I went back in there. I didn't see a damn deer the whole day, but um, kind of goes back to lessons learned is like, trust your gut. Because the, the areas that I pinned on the map that I thought, based on what my criteria were, those three criteria you mentioned, Tyson, the areas that I picked out on a map overhead, I saw deer. And then the, the areas that I listened to the locals that told me to like go out to this area and uh, try to focus on this is when I didn't see any deer during those sits. So um, it's a give and take. Um, it, as is with everything with deer hunting, you know, some people don't like out-of-state hunters or non-local hunters coming into their area and hunting, but, um, you know, I, it, anytime I'm out in the woods, it's, it's an experience and I learned something from it. You know what I mean? So, um, I don't know if that answered your question. Good enough. Well, you screwed up because you didn't do what Jacob did. You didn't bring anybody lunch. So <laughs> I actually, if, for those that are not uh, understanding what Tyson's talking about, Jacob kind of gave the story last podcast, episode four, and he said that uh, he had his truck break down, but he also took a, what is it, burgers and lunch to the local bait shop? Yeah, I talked to him the day before, and I thought he was being pretty genuine and giving me some some solid advice. So I bought him a burger and fries, and then my truck broke down. He was the first guy I called, and he had a buddy of a buddy that was able to get me back up and running pretty quick. So it was a $5 <laughs> well spent. Nice. Yeah, I probably, looking back at it, um, I was staying in the camper of some local family here and they, you know, that that's the family that tipped me off to go back to this behind the Baptist church type of deal. Um, but, you know, looking back at it, every time that I went and saw a deer on a sit, it's exactly what I pinned out. You know, if you focus on the core basics of like you understanding what, what you prioritize when you're deer hunting, uh, tr basically trust your gut. That's, I should have trusted my gut more, especially on a on a four hour away trip to go to this WMA. But um, that's one thing I've seen lately with me starting to get more into public land and transition to like different private land, bouncing around between different properties. You know, is I'll get a tip about hey, this deer may be there's deer over this way, and whenever you go over there, you don't see nothing for. I put cameras out and I didn't see a thing. And then I'm like, well, I see on a map, this looks pretty good. And I'll go back there and I'll put a camera up and I'll get four or five good shooters coming through in a month's time. So yeah, I've always, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I just got to the point where I'm like, you know, I almost just rather take my original thoughts 
of going to one spot and sitting that out before I try to move around. Because I've seen that, like, in Missouri a couple more, or a month ago, a bunch of the guys were bouncing around not seeing anything. And I'm like, the more you bounce around, you're cutting your chances down because you're not really given one spot its potential to see something. Yeah, you're covering more real estate, but is it quality real estate? Yeah. Sorry, I had to restart the live here. Good. Um, so I guess what would be your your three biggest takeaways? Like so give me let's let's say three things you think you did really well and three takeaways that you need to improve on. So I think uh, things that I did well was being aggressive. I, I definitely was aggressive. I wasn't uh, typically your your areas that, you know, you know an area, it's, it's right in your backyard. You know the property very well. You kind of, as the season goes along, you get more and more aggressive to the rut. Um, I was aggressive from the start point. So I would say that that was beneficial for me. Um, let's see. The other things I did good was it, it was a, Anytime that you're faced with a large property like that and you just go try is always a win, right? Like just because I didn't have success doesn't mean I didn't learn anything. So I would say in this, in a sense that that was something positive, the negatives I could, I could go on for days on end. Um, <laughs> I, I always tried to, the other positive thing was anytime I went into a, a sit, I always played the wind I, I, when I went in there, I was almost being not decisive enough. I was thinking too much. I don't know if this is a pro or con, but basically I was thinking about the wind direction. I was thinking about where I was setting up on the, on the, on the timber, where I could be seen from, where I could be picked off from a deer. So I was playing that all into the decision of what tree I would, was going to get in. Um, the biggest takeaway I would say that I could, I could have done better was knowing my gear. Um, I did, I did start, start off with doing a new, uh, basically a saddle platform before heading out here and, uh, the saddle platform for anyone that's not done it before, um, going out in the woods for the first time using it. I don't recommend that. I did. <laughs> yeah. it. What's that? Especially in the dark. <laughs> no, don't use a saddle platform the first time in the tree. <laughs> no. And, uh, I, I have a couple trees out and back and, uh, I practiced it before I went out there, but at the same time. It was probably like my eighth or ninth sit going in there in the middle of uh, when it was dark out trying to set up. And I, I learned a couple things about it myself, like not necessarily about myself, but the gear. Like I need to tape tape extra straps so there's not loose straps. Um, I need to deaden the sound. So I need to put some silencing strips on all of my gear. I need to take some 550 cord and I need to wrap it around the, uh, the platform and all my sticks as well because there's a lot of ting that happens, like metal to metal contact. Um, so that's all stuff that I'm going to kind of get situated and fixed before I go out on my next time, hopefully in Alabama in early January. So. Yeah, you definitely overthink. Oh, dude. Everything like, when it comes. That, that, that is my best. That is my. That's probably my weakest. Like. Uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, or that's your biggest very, downfall as a hunter is your, yeah, for sure. your Intel, your Intel mindset from the intel of being in the navy and that whole process you putting that into your hunting is that's your biggest downfall like when we were I planning to go for this spot in stock well we should do this or we should go here well i'm thinking we should change here and i'm like why let's we last saw this big buck here let's just get close as we can where we can where we can legally hunt let's get close yeah figure it out and go from that analysis but before paralysis. that it was you know Dude, I, it's a, in a, in a for the for the non-military folks in the in the room or listening on live or on this podcast. It's a in the military you've been trained through the global war on terrorism. It's like you have a target, and that target is like for me the target is the deer, and then you go through a litany of data points to make the decision on like how to kinetically go after this person, and so um, that to to Tyson's point, like Tyson's known me probably the longest here. Um, analysis by paralysis. I think Jacob, you said it perfectly. Every data point that you can have in the deer woods, I try to take that into consideration 
when I go out there, when sometimes I just need to go out there and say, let me just go, you know, sit there and see what I see. You know what I mean? Yeah, but your your data points have data points who then have data points. <laughs> it's like a tiered <laughs> intel process for you that's just too much. Like, you know, what? What I, Sorry, this I, looks I, good. He was here. This looks like a good spot. Screw it. Let's go. I, I was I was sitting here talking and I had my I had my mic muted where I'd flipped over to uh <laughs> to watch to see if you were breathing into the phone on live and, and I didn't realize that I was muted. <laughs> um, what, I, what I was, what I was going to say was every, everyone's got their own, you know, their own preference of, of stuff. We were, you know, you were discussing moving, moving, moving and stuff. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of just the opposite. Like <clears throat> when I go into a spot, I will literally get in there before daylight and I do not move. I do not come out for lunch. I sit there until pitch black dark 99% of the time. Um, and that's just the way that I've always done it. Um, you know, even if I, even if I kill a deer, if I shoot a deer and you know, say it's, uh, 11 AM or something, um, I'll still sit there depending on what the temperature is. Now, if it's too hot, you know, of course, I, I can't do that. But if if it's uh, if it's pretty cool, I'll sit there till pitch black dark. I mean, it's, I, it's crazy. Everyone has their own their own way of doing yeah. it. You look at how many people, you know, like JW, you'll sit there all day. I'll sit for a while, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm getting impatient. I throw my stalkers on. And I just go have fun. Because either way, you know, it's everyone has their own their own thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's what um, people fail to realize. You can't just watch YouTube and you got, you know, all these beautiful kill shots and all this cool shit on YouTube, but people don't really realize how many sets those guys sat and filmed and didn't see a damn thing before oh, it's that one shot. Hours upon hours, yeah. you know, unless unless they're hunting high fence. I mean, I took yeah, it. Which took I can't it. afford that. 250 <laughs> gig SD card. I filled it full of footage with zero deer for my same Houston hunt. Right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, that's uh, you know, that's the uh, that's the beauty of uh, the reality. Uh, I, I should say of uh, of filming hunts is, you know, the majority of the people don't understand how long it takes. You know, it, you you've not got but fifteen seconds of that kill shot, but it takes multiple hours upon hours upon hours of sitting in the uh, of of stand time you know to get that to get that 15 seconds yeah yeah i mean that's what i tell my son all the time he what he's he's always on youtube watching all these different kill shot videos and it's like he why can't you shoot like that because that's not how it works not like they put in hundreds you know, of hours to get that one 10 second shot so something else that I found is is majority of of people are are very impatient. You know, um, I've uh, I've got a buddy that I used to hunt with some, and he he literally cannot sit still. Uh, I mean, we get in the woods before daylight at eight o'clock. I would I would see him over there stomping around somewhere. You know, I mean, literally just couldn't sit still and. You know, I, I tried to, I tried to, to <clears throat> he didn't, he, he didn't know this, but I mean, I, I kind of placed myself where I figured it would be to my advantage because I knew he was going to get up and start stomping around and push something, maybe push something over to me, yeah. you know, but I mean that, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's just the way it is. And, uh, you know, going back to your hunt, Luke, that you were, uh, that you were on with those, with those guys walked up on you. Um, you know, that was, uh. <clears throat> it's, it, it, those it, people kind of gravitate towards that area to, to to like what you were sitting in, you know. Yeah. It's, and, it's weird because you're you're a uh, sorry to interrupt you, JW. You have like a you have a mentality where you're trying to get deer on camera and you're trying to see deer and you're trying to film them in advance. Uh, where I should have been was the thickest stuff ever, and it's hard to film back in the thickest stuff ever because you got basically 
not even five seconds to be able to react react to that deer coming in, get them on right. film, get the bow ready, and then uh, and shoot. So I was looking for those wide open areas, and you're right, like your typical public land hunter that just goes out there on you know Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or whatever like that. They look for those spots, and so it's kind of a double edged sword. You're right. Yep. Um, I believe if uh, back in uh, <clears throat> what was it, podcast one or two, we we talked about this. Um, you know, kind of where we would want to set up and and that, and you know, <clears throat> that's uh, what what you were what you were referring to back in you know setting back you know, 40, 50, 60 yards in that, in that area, you know, it, <clears throat> I believe that would uh, probably have been your best bet, um, you know, and because, I mean, I, I just, I find it pretty, <clears throat> you know, I don't think that the deer, especially with the pressure, because evidently where you were at there had, had, has had a lot of pressure. Oh, it was, uh, that that's probably one of the most pressured public lands that I've ever hunted before. Um, yeah, because it's one of the few places you can hunt in Texas. That's that's Unless something I, I didn't really touch on. These high fences. You know, when when I went in on that first morning, my first access point was actually not available because there was three trucks there, and then I drove I drove you know five minutes down the road again, two trucks there. Then I drove another a mile down the road, and then that gate was empty. So I had to go to my original pin, but I had to I had to entry or enter from that property from an area that I wasn't familiar with or haven't looked at the map. So that was tough. Challenges, man. That's uh, that's that's probably my biggest complaint with with Texas is the 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 accessibility to hunt. Yeah, you know you have to you have to own property, you have to know people that own property, or you have to make a shit ton of money to go hunt on these high fence ranches um, or be in the military. We have access to military bases. So I, I'm that's crazy. That's that packed, but I'm not surprised. Um, all right. So does anybody look, you got anything else? No, I, I just say just to, to basically to sum everything up would be um, I should have been more mobile. I shouldn't have set up in a spot um, expecting to sit there for four hours five hours to, to see a deer. So I should have been more mobile. Um, I should have trusted my gut with my original pins that I dropped based on what I would have seen deer based on my past experience. So like I said, you put a pin on a transition zone, you know, three quarters of the way back into the mountain, you know, you should have trusted your gut, you know, based on your e-scouting. And then um, also just make sure you know your gear before you go into a sit like that. Um, you know, it's... Anything in the deer woods can can make those bucks walk away. And if that's like one stick touching another stick that might sound like a metal clanginess, like they're going to walk away from that. So if you don't practice and practice and practice before you go out in the actual sit, like you're, you're in bad company, man. Like the deer are not going to hang around because they're so pressured. Anytime they smell a human, anytime they hear a human, anytime they hear something that's not normal in the deer woods, they're going to run away. So you just have to keep practicing to say, look, I know my gear. I know my gear is silent. And, and that's what I, the silent side of the whole, my setup is what I need to work on before I go to Alabama. So you, you got any other plans hunting wise coming up? Um, Really just, well, my bucks tag is clipped out there and uh, on base. So I'll be filming you whenever you mm -hmm. go out. So between, between now and then that's, that's basically what I got going on. Okay. JW, what do you got? Well, we got the neighborhood book you're gonna go after soon, huh? Uh, yeah, I've got the I've got the the rogue neighborhood buck that uh that's stalking everybody when they're walking their dogs. So you know, that's uh that'll be next weekend. Um I'll be out there and filming that. Um hopefully I'll uh I'll make short work of that and and uh make the the trip back home but that's uh that's about all i got um coming up next week uh logan we got uh 
What day we leave Missouri, Luke? Friday? Uh, Friday? We're headed out. Yeah, next either Thursday night or Friday. We're leaving. I'll be hunting every day for probably the next two weeks, just about. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen you go- y'all going duck hunting out there or are you guys doing a mix? Uh doing the mix. If the deer movement's good, we're we're we'll go ahead and buy our uh deer tags as well. I already but have mine, for so. <laughs> yeah, Logan already has his so so I ain't spending no extra money. <laughs> yeah, so my go. wife and I will be getting them if the deer are moving good. Okay. But you're prime so you're primarily going for duck hunting then. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. And then you're saying if that if that doesn't look good, you guys are talking about going to Houston? Yeah, if if it's frozen up there, it's not frozen yet. There's snow on the ground, but it's not froze. Yet. The uh, all the water ain't froze yet. So as long as it don't freeze, we're going south. So, or lo- if it does freeze, we're going south. Ooh. All yeah, right, Jacob, what do you got going on? Uh, I'm gonna switch it up a little bit. Um, when the weather gets cold here in the U.S., a lot of uh, a lot of great fish species migrate migrate back down south. Some will head to Nicaragua, Nicaragua for a for like a seven day. We're gonna do a spear fishing trip. Be on the Pacific side. <laughs> yeah, a little different, but we uh we should be able to get on some rooster fish and a bunch of cabrera snapper and stuff like that. It should be a good time. Lobsters, ton of lobster down there. Yeah, you're gonna have your GoPro. You're gonna have your GoPro strapped on you. Oh yeah. You can put we'll that on your head. Yeah. That sounds awesome. I'm I'm excited to see that footage. That sounds yeah, that sounds like pretty cool. Blast. Absolutely. Uh, well, for me, um, kind of got a mix of stuff. Um, got all those raccoons showing up, so I'm probably gonna go out there with my IR scope with my son and let him blow some shit up. And Mine's then, going off right now. Like I'm sitting here looking at the thing as it's oh, going yeah. off. Yeah, I probably and got my AR might just get used tonight through the woods. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm going to take him out there. We got some foxes coming through. The neighbor um, next to that property has, um, he started off with like 120 chickens at the beginning of the year, and he's down to like 40. Ooh. So he told me, he's like, I don't care. You can shoot whatever, foxes, uh, coyotes. So take my son out there with the IR scope. He hasn't got a buck this year, so I'll probably take him out um, Saturday morning. My wife's got her work Christmas party Friday, so that kind of shot those plans down to go Friday. But take him out Saturday morning. If we get something, gut it, and there's a little burn pit on the back side of the property. Throw that those guts in there, and then I'll just set my boy up with the IR scope, and I'll kick back in the bush drinking beer while he shoots some stuff. So that's my plan. And then next weekend, um, going actually with my brother-in-law out to uh, – a ranch over by uh Maynard and Rock Springs. Uh it's, you got a his brother backed out, so he gave me his spot. So I'm gonna go out there and probably just cruise around, drink some beer and have fun. But then I have access to a property that's about an hour away and I'm not paying those high fence prices. So I may just get up early in the morning, drive out to that property and see there's some there's Axis, Audad, um Fallow and Whitetail out at the property that's about an hour away so see if we can get something on that but outside of that don't really have much plan other than the honey do list and might try to get my 65 mustang running again that's all hey, i got hey clear sight outdoors do you have any questions for us he jumped off Okay. Cool. Well, I think that's pretty much wraps it up, huh? Yeah. Anyone else yeah. had any success recently? Yeah. No. no. Don't don't run too good on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I was kind of all over the place with my San Houston breakdown, but ultimately it's uh you know, I I made a shit ton of mistakes. Um, but it's only gonna make me a better hunter in the future, right? Like um trust your gut that, that's all i got when you go out in the woods trust your gut well i mean just get out in the woods make mistakes because you get better i mean jw and i talked about that last podcast it doesn't matter what even if you get in the woods and you make you know thousand mistakes you're learning from that you know every, every little bit you can get out in the woods you're going to become out you're going to come out a better hunter than you did when you went in so absolutely it just it 
it takes years and years and years for the experience, you yeah. know? Yeah. You can't, you can't teach that. That's something you just got to get out there and adapt and overcome and get better as you go. So, well, yep. thank you all for watching. Uh, we appreciate it. We are on Apple podcasts. So uh, head over there, give us a like, follow, subscribe, whatever the technical terms are. I don't know. That's more Luke's field. Um, but go over, do all that stuff. We're on what? Instagram, snap face. No, TikTok, snap face. Uh, snap face. Facebook, <laughs> run all that stuff. So the only one we don't have is Snapchat. That's it. <laughs> Snapchat. We don't have that one, but we got the other ones. I think we need somebody under the age of 26 to run the Snapchat. I can do that. (laughs) That's the one thing I'm actually decent with. (laughs) So, yeah, search us, follow us. Uh, We're going to be on a wild ride here, and we're uh, we're excited to see what the future holds. So thank you all for for watching, and we'll catch you next time.